Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Maria Elena Pena, and I am the Medical Director for the Diabetes Alliance for the Mount Sinai Health System, as well as the Endocrine um, Director here at our Forest Hills location. And today we'll be talking about um, standards of medical care in diabetes, Basically, we're going to go over a summary of current guidelines, talk about uh, the pathophysiology of diabetes, and talk about treatment guidelines. Next slide. So in general, we always want to start off with classifying diabetes. And I know as a lot of primary care doctors, um, you're used to doing this. So just to summarize, um, type one diabetes is due to an autoimmune um, disorders due to the autoimmune uh, destruction of beta cells in the pancreas, which, which leads to a relative uh, decreased deficiency in insulin production. Whereas type two diabetes is not only a progressive beta cell loss that we're experiencing, but also insulin resistance. So even though the insulin is being produced, uh, the patient, the insulin itself is not working. The receptors are not working. I always um, explain to my patients kind of a lock and key scenario where uh, with time, the key is just not going into the lock properly. Hence, we're not having a uh, good insulin production. There's also gestational diabetes, which we know normally diagnosed in the second or third trimester of pregnancy. And this tends to increase a woman's risk of developing diabetes throughout her lifetime by 50%. So, and we'll talk over the, the, the population at risk and who needs to be screened for diabetes. But essentially, uh, these patients are at a higher risk for subsequent diabetes in their future uh, pregnancies and also for developing regular type 2 diabetes um, as they get older. And then we have our specific um, other types of diabetes. And I bring this up because you know you have your monogenic, monogenic diabetes syndrome, such as Modi, for example, LADA, which is latent uh, um, autoimmune diabetes in adulthood. Essentially, think of a patient that comes to you at age 50, let's say, and all of a sudden develops diabetes. And this patient is normal weight. I tend to, to, to screen these patients for a lot of just in case. So I'll check a C-peptide, for example, I'll check some antibodies in them just to make sure that I'm not missing, misdiagnosing them as just plain type two when maybe they have an underlying autoimmune process going on. So always when I, you have your patients, always, you know, even if a person has been sent to you with a diagnosis of type two diabetes or even type one diabetes, and they haven't had a recent workup, I try to say, let's just check some antibodies just to make sure that we're treating the right diabetes, especially if they're not responding to treatment or if you see a big discrepancy in, in, in like they were well controlled at one point now they're not controlled and they're trying to eat well they have a normal weight so that's why i'm always saying it's always important to realize that this is not very straightforward you sometimes have to do a little bit of investigating because there is a small percentage of patients that i realize were not diagnosed correctly so next slide so how do we screen for diabetes and pre-diabetes? And this is one of my biggest um, like issues sometimes with some of the patients that are referred to me is that many times even um, there is a little discrepancy as what A1C constitutes pre-diabetes and at what point does it become diabetes? So for the record, Normal A1C is anything 5.6 or less. When you are anywhere from 5.7 to 6.4, that's considered pre-diabetes. At 6.5 or higher, that's full-blown diabetes. Many times patients are referred to me and they tell me, oh, I have pre-diabetes. And when I checked their A1C was 6.7. Guess what? That's diabetes. And it's very important for us to address this population. Yes, they're not severely uncontrolled, but the earlier you diagnose the patient, at a lower A1C that you diagnose the patient, you can actually help induce remission or help prevent complications and have better outcomes, better control. So it's very important to uh, reiterate that diabetes is diagnosed with an A1C of 6.5 or higher. That being said, there's other ways of diagnosing diabetes, not as common. I do feel that A1C is still the most uh, reliable for many of our patients, but there's other ways. So a fasting glucose of 100 to 125 is considered pre-diabetes over 126, that's diabetes. Um, a random glucose of over 200 at any point, that's diabetes as well. 
but if you let's say do a, a glucose tolerance test and, and which we rarely do. So I'm just adding this for academic purposes, but we rarely have the time um, and right now, and by the fact, the, the simple fact that we have an A1C test to do for our patients is much more, it's quicker, it's very reliable, and we're kind of going away, doing away with the whole oral glucose tolerance testing. But I do find that oral glucose tolerance testing is beneficial in our patients who may have a normal A1C but may have this postprandial hyperglycemia. And really, prediabetes really starts with that. Many times, it's this postprandial hyperglycemia, and that can be caught with the oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, next slide. So, what's the criteria for screening asymptomatic adults? So, I will go over the criteria, um, but in general, the best, the best rule of thumb is if someone is overweight, has gained weight recently, or is over a BMI of 30, automatically screening them. That's my recommendation to you because many of our patients, even to this day, remain undiagnosed. And that's a big problem. That's actually what's adding to the problem that we're having with um, this battle with diabetes and prediabetes. But what the guideline recommends is the following. They're saying that patients should be tested if they're overweight or obese according to BMI criteria and have one or more of the following risk factors, a first degree relative with diabetes, high risk race or ethnicity, they're saying African-American, Latino, Native American, Asian American, Pacific Islander. But even this is a little bit tricky because what do we do with our patients who are of a mixed race? Um, we also have to screen patients who have a history of cardiovascular disease, patients who have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as uncontrolled hypertension, a systolic of over 140 uh, with a diastolic of over 90. Um, LDL levels less than 35 or dyslipidemia or elevated LDL. Are women with polycystic ovarian syndrome very, very important? Part of the PCOS syndrome is insulin resistance, is prediabetes. Um, patients who have a sedentary lifestyle and other things, and here they make it very general, other clinical conditions associated with insulin resistance, severe obesity, acanthosis, nigra cancer, your patients, for example, who are on chronic steroids, um, that can lead to insulin resistance. I would like to add our patients are sometimes on antipsychotic medications, many medications, even some of uh, the stronger antidepressants, such as Lexapro, for example, or Zoloft. These patients are at a higher risk of developing overweight or obesity from the medication and subsequently developing insulin resistance from these medications. So they too should be screened. And um, they're also going on here, patients with prediabetes. If you have a patient who has prediabetes, these patients should be followed up closely because anything can set them off and put them in the diabetes range. Um, women, again, what we were saying, women who've been diagnosed with gestational diabetes in the past should have lifelong testing. And here they're recommending at least every three years. I personally would recommend at least every year during their physical. Um, the guidelines also go on to say that patients should be tested after age 45, that everyone should be at least tested at least once for a screen for diabetes. And if testing is normal, it should be repeated at least every three years. Or like I like to say, you know, every time a person is having a physical, I think it's worth um, checking in and see. More recently, as more patients, as more data is coming out, we're realizing that a lot of our patients who were normal glycemic and had COVID infection became pre-diabetic and patients who had pre-diabetes and COVID infections subsequently developed diabetes. So those patients should also be screened. Next slide. So preventing or delaying type two diabetes. It's important to realize, especially in the US, that as the obesity epidemic came about, we had a subsequent rise in, in the incidence of diabetes. They kind of go hand in hand together. So even though there is a genetic component to diabetes and it has to do also a lot with, uh, with weight, you know, the first thing is first, lifestyle intervention is the first thing to do. Even in patients who are being treated with medications, with pharmacotherapy, I tell them you're being treated with a medication, but you also have to be treated with diet. That's essentially very important. You really cannot do one without the other. And many of our patients who have, there, there's, and all this data we have from the diabetes prevention program trial, and these trials, and there's an old trial, but these trials actually showed that the incidence of type two diabetes could be reduced by 
almost 60% over the course of three years. So that's a pretty significant impact if you think about it. Uh, just with lifestyle interventions alone. So the lifestyle interventions do go a long way. Um, achieving and maintaining a 7% weight loss from initial body weight and along with doing a moderate diet uh, physical activity such as brisk walking helped uh, it in preventing diabetes in these patients. Other things that you can suggest to many of your patients who are pre-diabetic and overweight is enrolling them in a weight management program or considering um, now, instead of using the term bari bariatric surgery, we use the term metabolic surgery, considering uh, bariatric surgery in these patients who've shown that they've been struggling with weight for a long time in hopes that this will either help put their diabetes into a remission or at least delay or prevent diabetes. So pharmacological interventions. The guidelines are recommending that we can initiate metformin therapy in patients with prediabetes and with a BMI over 35. I personally, uh, and under 60 years of age, I'm a little bit more liberal with this recommendation. And I feel that even your patients who are overweight and have prediabetes, by initiating, initiating metformin, you can help with a little bit of weight loss and can also help prevent or delay progression into diabetes. And we can also consider, just like I mentioned before, just enrolling them in the, into a weight management program where they're getting obesity medications that can help them with weight loss. And this can subsequently help uh, with the prevention of diabetes. So as we know, even prediabetes in itself is associated with higher cardiovascular risk. Um, and that's why these patients are our target population. When we target this population, we're really preventing a lot of morbidity and, mor and mortality. And taking advantage of our diabetes self-management and education support. So all of these programs may be appropriate resources for our patients that have prediabetes and need more education and support. So all of this, basically dietary counseling, weight management programs, all of these things can help our patients treat their prediabetes and prevent progression to, into diabetes. Or if they have diabetes already, helping with outcomes, helping them tolerate medications better, helping them achieve that A1C goal with less medications. Next slide. So I'm sure this model is called the Comprehensive Medical Evaluation and Assessment of Comorbidity. So this model can essentially be applied to any chronic condition, um, then being not only diabetes, but hypertension, hyperlipidemia, weight loss, amongst other things. And what you tend to do in this cycle is really a, a cycle patient psych center this is glycemic management type two diabetes, but you know you have to review and agree on a management program. It's always very good. Um, you get better outcomes when the patient is actively involved in their care. That gives them a sense of control as well, instead of just giving the control to the to the physician or the or the uh, healthcare provider. So you want to review and agree on a plan. And I always start with small things, small goals, you know, ideally you can't tell a patient, even though, even though the recommendations are you know, several servings of vegetables a day, low fat, 150 minutes of, of exercise a week, let's start with five minutes a week, a, a day, let's say, or let's start with, let's work, you have three meals, all three are unhealthy, let's start with, let's say, eliminating or decreasing sugary beverages, even though they're still having their, their bagel, even if they're still having their croissant, we want to start with a small plans that they feel can be attainable, that way they feel like they're progressing, they're succeeding, instead of feeling like a failure, so I always start, you know, re you review and agree, uh, then you go over, you know, and you do this, again, I'm going to kind of tie in everything, but Maybe it's a patient that finds it very, very difficult because of childcare, because of access to food, because of work schedule. So we want to start with things that they have control over. So you really want to take the time to really assess what are those things in life that are barriers to preventing you to adhere to good lifestyle um, changes, medication adherence, et cetera. So you want to look at their current lifestyle, comorbidities. Um, you know, are they depressed? For example, many of our patients quote unquote, are deemed non-compliant, but at the core of the problem is maybe there's some underlying mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. And that apathy was letting to them kind of giving up and saying, I'm not taking my medicines. I'm not going to make the, the changes I need to make. So those are things you wanna come up with an A1C target. And I'll go over that a little shortly. What are the targets of A1C? In general, the healthier your patient, the younger you want to have stricter A1C targets. As the patient gets older, more comorbidities 
those targets can be a little bit less strict. We want to, um, so you implement these plans, you set up meeting goals. Okay, I'll see you every three months. I personally believe that sometimes every three months is just not enough. If your office or your practice allows for it, in between, try to have uh, um, your patient follow up closely with a dietitian, with a diabetic educator, or set up virtual visits, which are a little bit easier to do more frequently, just to kind of touch base. In some patients, three months may not be enough, maybe a little bit too much. We kind of lose the fire in them. And, um, you know, agreeing on the, the, the management plans, you know, specify SMART goals. So SMART is the act, uh, stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time limited. So you want to be a specific. Let's work on your breakfast let's say let's work on sugary drinks you want to say okay if you were having five drinks let's bring it down to two drinks a day something that they can actually do something that's realistic with your lifestyle and then time okay i want you to achieve this by the next visit which will be in four to six weeks let's say and that's how you set up a plan that the patient is is clear on you're clear on and that kind of gives you better outcomes so next slide so talking about targets, I, I have like the, I find myself sometimes having two uh, uh, extremes in my patient population. I have younger patients that are really not very proactive and have sugars in the 200s and they're like, oh, that's normal for me because I normally am in three and four hundreds. I feel, I feel sick at 150. That's one example. And then I have my older patients who are overly controlled. They have an A1C of sometimes 6% and they're 85 and they're over medicated and they get hypoglycemia. That too is not good. So you have to really see um, where your patient is at and, and it's something that's going to be safe for them and that will minimize the risk of hypoglycemia and complications. So in general, we recommend A1 testing at least twice a year in patients who have met treatment goals. So if your patient has been stable, you can actually decrease the frequency of visits and check at least two times a year. However, in patients, you're actively changing medications, patients who are not at goal, you want to have more frequent A1C checks, and that would be every three months. I find that point of care testing for A1C is very convenient because you get real-time A1C results and you can make real-time changes instead of doing the blood work, waiting for the results to come in, then calling the patients to make changes. So I feel that in some practices, especially practices that have a lot of diabetics, uh, a, a point of care machine might be uh, worth, uh, worth the time for both the patient and for the pro provider. So glucose assessment. So with the newer medications that are out, if a patient is not on insulin and there are medicines such as GLP-1s, SGLT-2s, metformin, those medications are virtually impossible to become hypoglycemic. And if for the most part they're well controlled, I'm, actually, I'm not too crazy about so many uh, frequent finger stick checks um, because that just causes a lot of pain and neuropathy in some patients. So you have to really pick and choose. Obviously, if the patient is uncontrolled, I do recommend more frequent finger stick checking because at least that gives them that feedback that they need to make maybe changes in what they, in what they ate. The good thing is that we now have these CGMs, the two most common ones being the Freestyle Libre and the Dexcom sensors. And what these do is that they're not 100% accurate in the sense that sometimes I feel they do overestimate the hypos, but they are great to look at trends. And that's a great feedback for the patient and also great for you. That if you start seeing trends where they're becoming hypoglycemic overnight, or they're, they're great, but they spike at lunch or they spike at dinner, you can point that out. That visual is both helpful to you and to your patient to say, okay, this is where we need to attack this. So I do find that now with the atoms of CGMs, we're getting more data, it's better. Because again, many patients will check their sugars in the morning. Their morning sugars are great. It's their postprandial sugar that's ha that's an issue. And that's where they miss it. I don't know if sometimes purposely or not, but they just check the morning, 120, 130, I'm good. And I tell my patients that changes every minute of the day. That changes with physical activity, that changes with obviously what you're eating and stress uh, amongst other things. So it's these uh, sensors are great. Um, unfortunately, they're not covered in patients over the age of 65 if they're not doing four injections a day. But for the most part, we are getting better coverage in patients under the age of 65 to so get these continuous readings. And what they do is that right now, this is just a sample report. This The report gives you a summary. It tells you what percentage of the time they're in range and you can set that range for your patients. I normally like 80 to 180 in general. I think it's, it's um, easier but if they're older, I might do 100 to 180, for example. So you set the target range and it gives you good percentages of how many times they're within range, above range, below range.
Next slide. So again, going over targets, the majority of patients we recommend in A1C in non-pregnant adults uh, 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 less than 7%. If they're pregnant, we want it to be less than 6.5%. But the younger your patient is, and then you can look at the graph right here towards the, the bottom right, you know, the things that take that, that impact what are the goals you want to know, you know, what is the risk, like I said, of hypoglycemia, how long have ha they've had diabetes, what is their life expectancy, what are their comorbidities, do they have vascular complications? What do they prefer? That's also part of it. What can they afford? What, can they, uh, what do they prefer? And what are their resources? So again, the younger my patients, the less comorbidities, uh, I tend to want to keep them closer to that 6.5 range. However, as they get older, especially in my patients, I really want to stress it, as you get into your late 70s and 80s, that A1C goal can be 8%, and that is perfectly acceptable for many reasons. You're decreasing polypharmacy, you're decreasing the risk of hypoglycemia, the risk of side effects, and also co-pays as things are getting more expensive, you're decreasing this. So um, I think that's a great, uh, that's a good approach for many of our patients, just kind of following that. You know, if they have a strong family history of cardiovascular disease, and maybe they've had a stent and you want to prevent another one, then you want to be a little bit stricter in that patient. But really you want to be, uh, A1C goals are really patient specific for the most part. Next slide. So this uh, is just one slide, but it's actually a very busy slide. And I want to focus on this. So you know, what the, a lot has changed when it comes to the treatment of diabetes. No longer are we only focused on A1C goal, we're also focused on cardiovascular disease prevention and, and renal pr uh, disease prevention as well, amongst other things. And with that mentality, we are really thinking independent of A1C at this point. But to date, and actually today we got, there were some new updates in Europe, the guidelines are changing as well, but we're still going to stick by metformin is still your preferred initial pharmacological agent in patients with, the, with type 2 diabetes. I, um, I personally recommend the extended release formulations because, because you can, uh, instead of doing a twice a day dosing, you could do a once a day, which helps with compliance. And also patients tend to do a little bit better when it comes to GI side effects. I also tend to max out their metformin. You want to max out the one agent before adding another one for the most part. And it really should not be taken off. Even in patients who eventually go on to insulin, metformin is a great insulin sensitizer. So you're able to get away with less insulin by keeping the metformin on board. Um, but again, so this is where things change. So now we have this patient-centered approach where we're considering cardiovascular comorbidities, risk of hypoglycemia, impact on weight, cost, um, risk of side effects, et cetera. And that's where the whole GLP-1, SGLT-2, as you already know, GLP-1 is commonly known as Ozempic, which is semaglutide or dulaglutide, which is trulicity. And more recently, we now have semaglutide in oral form, which is rebelsis. And when it comes to the SGLT-2s, we have a large array of them. We have Jordans, we have Portiga, we have Stiglatra, we have Inucana. So all of these medications have very good data when it comes to cardiovascular risk uh, 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 reduction or prevention of events, and also when it comes to renal prevention. And that's where we're going out. As you can see, you know, when the, you have patients who have established disease or have indic or are high risk, and essentially every diabetic is at high risk for heart disease, because guess what? Diabetes is the number one risk factor for heart disease. So our patient, let's say, who has established kidney disease, you or heart failure, I forgot to mention this part, SGLT2s are indicated right now, independent of diabetes, SGLT2s are being used by cardiologists for the treatment of heart failure. So you really have to take into account all these things when giving these medications. Today, I was reading that in Europe right now, they're planning to even do away with metformin as first-line uh, therapy. They're thinking if your patient, let's say, ha happens to have diabetes and heart failure, just go straight to an SGLT2. Or let's say it's a patient who has diabetes and a stroke or diabetes and coronary artery disease, go for a GLP-1. My uh, summary is that GLP-1s are great for that, for ASCVD. So think about for plaque reduction and think about your SGLT-2s more for your heart failure and renal protection. 
So uh, you can also, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It could be synergistic. There's a lot of good data. So I'm big into pushing metformin. and I'm big into pushing GLP-1 and SGLT-2. That trifecta is very good because not only are you helping with cardiovascular risk reduction, but you're also helping with weight loss and, and, um, with, and reducing essentially no, virtually no hypoglycemia in these patients. Now, the guidance also went on to say the following. Even in your most uncontrolled patients, patients who have an A1C of even 15%, do you go with insulin or GLP-1? And what the guideline said is if you're thinking about injectable therapy, you should do GLP-1 first prior to insulin. And that's a big change. I still ask this a lot of patients still think insulin. And no, that's not the answer. We're thinking GLP-1 has to, be, has to come first before insulin therapy. If you find that even though even then your patient is very glucose toxic, needs insulin, you should do a basal insulin along with the GLP-1. Why? Because the GLP-1 will take care of that postprandial surge, and you're still minimizing the risk of hypoglycemia and the number of injections a patient is doing daily. So with the GLP-1, a once a week injection, or now with the oral uh, rebelsis or oral semaglutide, along with the basal insulin, your patient has that basal insulin background and the GLP-1 will take care of the postprandial surge. So again, very important that we're really doing away with insulin. We're trying to, with these newer medications, you're able to give less insulin. Less insulin means less weight gain, less hypoglycemia, and essentially insulin doesn't really render any cardiovascular benefit for the patient. And again, you know, whenever you are um, treating your patients, you want to at least see them every, every three to six months. Next slide. So again, the, the CVOT trials, right? The cardiovascular outcomes trials. So as many of you know, back in 2008, when we had issues with the TZDs. We noticed that there was a higher risk of, despite a good A1C control, we were still having worsening um, cardiovascular outcomes. So since then, the FDA has required that all diabetes medicines go through rigorous um, um, uh, trials to prove that they are safe. So safe for what's called MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events. And these trials have not only proven to show that these medicines are safe, but that they're also beneficial. So I'm sure and today this uh, presentation is not really focused on that, but there is data on all of them. So there have been large randomized controlled trials that have noted to have shown statistically significant reductions in cardiovascular events in at least three of the SGLT2s right now. So empagliflozin, which is Jardians, canagliflozin, which is Imopan, and dapagliflozin, which is Farsiga, and are in our FD and in our GLP-1s. So liraglutide is a Victoza, uh, albiglutide, which is tansium no longer in the market, but also we have semaglutide, and we have dilaglutide. So semaglutide, again, is ozempic. Dilaglutide is trulicity. And all of these have shown either primary, secondary prevention in cardiovascular disease. The SGLT2s um, have proven more and more data showing that they're reducing the risk of heart failure, hospitalization, and progression to kidney disease. So again, this kind of reinforces what I've been telling you that the, the guns are really shifting and we're focusing more and more on these medications. And these are almost becoming standards of care in many of our patients, just like a statin, just like an ACE. So last slide. Again, this is a summary of everything that we discussed. It goes over, you know, how to um, initiate these medications. If, um, if it's a patient that has, you know, coronary artery disease, stroke, you want to go, maybe go more towards a GLP-1 uh, uh, route. If it's a patient who has heart failure or renal disease, you want to do more of an SGLT-2. You can do both, especially in your patients who are uncontrolled. You really want to stay away from your TZDs, sulfonylureas, because they really don't render much benefit to your patients. Um, and that's about it. That's We're done for today. So most, give me one second. Next slide. So you can get, a, this is just a summary of everything. You can get a lot of this information uh, from the standards of care. I just did a quick summary. You could get more details on the studies and, and, and more specifics in the standards of care, which you can see here at this uh, link here and, and um, go over this in more detail. If you have any questions, please let me know, send your questions, email them or send them through Facebook. And that's all for today. Thank you for joining.